Jeffrey, that was such a, a very nice introduction and it's times like this that I, <clears throat> I think about my dear mother and father who are no longer with us. I'm sure that if my father were here, and perhaps he is, he would be beaming with pride. And if my mother were here, you would have certainly put her to tears. <laughs> um, I am confronted with a, an extraordinarily large challenge even before I start my formal remarks, and that is a challenge of protocol. This room is filled with so many dignitaries and leaders in finance and commerce <clears throat> that I don't know where to begin with my introductory remarks. So I would like to start with a little story of protocol. I, as Jeffrey mentioned, I had the great honor to travel to China um, with my secretary, Steven Mnuchin, with our former uh, USTR, Ambassador Lighthizer, uh, with then Secretary of Commerce, Wilbur Ross, Peter Navarro, uh, Under Secretary of Agriculture, to negotiate our phase one trade agreement. I actually uh, prepared myself at my desk on my own computer the first draft of the, the agreement that we tabled. Imagine our surprise after having landed on a military aircraft at Beijing Capital Airport, being whisked through security with no formalities. Everything was taken care of in advance through protocol channels driving straight to the embassy, having a meeting, preparatory meeting in, in a secure room with the whole of our team. Imagine our surprise to learn that the Chinese had put an agreement on the table that very morning that we had not yet even had the chance to review. <laughs> we got to Diao <clears> Tai. <throat> the energy in the air was palpable as we walked in, 100 strong delegation, all of our Chinese counterparts waiting for us, and we, we, uh, we were ushered into a, a grand room, as our friends from the Ministry of Finance, Yu Zhang, will, will be able to tell us that diplomacy is all about people, but before the people, there's protocol. Everybody got in from our side. Everybody was to take their seats and one chair was missing. Now the chairs and the seating assignments had been well, well rehearsed weeks in advance. The negotiations over the seating was probably more challenging than the substantive negotiation themselves. And I felt that it was very improper that one of our, one of our members of our negotiating team did not have a chair. He could not sit and participate in the meetings. I rushed to my seat, sat down, I dutifully took notes, nonstop. I, I thought I was back in law school, I was writing so fast. <laughs> and at our first break, the head of our protocol department at the US Embassy in Beijing was still negotiating with the head of protocol of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs over the seat back and forth and back and forth and back and forth and back and forth and of course we understood <clears throat> that the issue was that the Chinese side felt that when their vice premier had visited Washington DC some weeks prior they felt that he had been slighted in protocol and therefore we didn't get our chair I decided that this was a rather big issue what's what's a few hundred uh, million in, in tariffs, you know, the chair was a big issue and I proceeded to start to discuss matters with the Ministry of Foreign Affairs head of protocol back and forth. Nice arguments, not so nice arguments, sweet words, not so sweet words, until finally I saw the <clears throat> governor of the People's Bank of China walk by, Yi Gang, who I, I know well, <clears throat> and I said, Governor Yi, we have a little problem here. We can't get our chair. I explained the issue to him. 
He went back and forth with the head of protocol. He wasn't getting anywhere. I, I figured I had enough. So I walked away, I excused myself, and as I was leaving, I said to the governor in clear earshot of the, the protocol colleague, Governor E, I welcome you to my house. I will cook a wonderful banquet for you the next time that you visit the United States. You can come to my house and bring as many people as you like. You'll have as many chairs as you like. <laughs> we came back into the room and guess what? Our chair was there. <laughs> and I tell you this story of protocol before I even get into the substance of my talk because I have dear old friends here of, of the highest rank and the highest order. And I, I cannot name every single one out of protocol before I start my remarks as I should. So with leave from our dear friend Tsujang from the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, who should be the representative pro for protocol at this meeting. Let me just declare all protocols observed. How's that for an introduction to an introduction? <laughs> I, I must apologize for speaking in English. Um, I suppose that I, I could have prepared all of the for the talk today. Um, I feel that it would come out smoother in English. If there are any questions to what I'm saying, I'd be very happy to respond to the best of my ability in Chinese. Uh, and feel free during the Q&A to, to uh, ask questions in Chinese. Uh, Su Chi, when he started, was, uh, was correct in his introduction, as was Jeffrey, that I do speak Chinese. I, I actually speak two dialects of Chinese fluently, Mandarin and Cantonese. But I, I eat in eight dialects. <laughs> and on the issue of, of Q&A, we have one final item of protocol. Those of you that were here last week will recall that in the Jewish Center, we, ha we have one rule of protocol. Of course, every rule of protocol is there to be broken, but we have one rule of protocol relating to questions and answers. You all may ask as many questions as you like, even during my remarks. But we have a division of labor. Xiao Su, Da Su. Hard questions, Xiao Su. Easy questions, Da Su. Hard questions, by definition, are those that I know the answer to. As long as we follow that protocol, everything will be great. Su Qi, Lao Da. Su Lao Da. It's wonderful to be here today. Thank you so much, and thank you to your foundation, and thanks to the chairman uh, for, for having me and for inviting me and for arranging this, uh, this august gathering. And my final introductory remark, of course, I would be extraordinarily remiss if I did not thank our, our exceptional host and his dear uh, lovely wife uh, for their gracious hospitality since the moment, even before I arrived in Taiwan, uh, until now. And I don't want to comment on the hospitality, the soft side. I don't want to comment on the food. I don't want to comment on the warmth of the friendship. What I do want to comment on, for the benefit of all of you, is this extraordinary building. I invite each and every one of you to come here on your own time. Jeffrey, I'm sure, will be happy to arrange a private tour. There are treasures of exceptional magnitude hanging on the wall. There are treasures of history. This building is a living, living history of the Jewish people. Not only are, are, is every item rich in culture, but the, the, the value of what's hanging on the wall monetarily is not small. So thank you very much, Jeffrey. And on the, on the issue of monetary points, let me, let me now start my talk. I've, I've prepared a couple of slides, and I wanted to start the presentation with reference to calamity. I wanted to start with a reference to disaster. I wanted to start with a reference to frustration in the financial context, because that's what I would like to talk about today. This is a picture of a trader on the floor at the New York Stock Exchange in the midst of the 2008 crisis. 
And what I'd like to talk about in reference to the recent spate of bank failings is what happened, what the regulatory response was. I'd like to spend a couple of minutes discussing whether it was the right approach or whether there was perhaps a better, different course of action, what the implications are both of the events and the regulatory actions, and what will be next. <clears throat> And I'd like to start, <coughs> excuse me, with a little bit of background relating to the market generally, because I think it's important to put recent events in a more global macro context. And what we are seeing today is a series of cracks in the facade, in the very foundation of the banking market of a magnitude that we have never seen before. The last series of bank failures that we had in the United States was during and in the wake of the 2008 financial crisis, which had its own reasons and its own causal links. Today it's different. Uh, and I'm going to tell you about why today is different, but I wanted to start with reference to the sheer size and magnitude of the problem. First Republic, Silicon Valley Bank, and Signature Bank were among the largest U.S. bank failures since 2008. I invite you to look at the second, third, and fourth lines. What you see on the screen are the largest bank failures since 2008, and you will notice that every single one of them happened between 08 and 10, and they are dwarfed by the size of Silicon Valley, First Republic, and Signature. And to put matters, the same issue, in a slightly different context, to attach some specific numbers what you can see on the far right is the sum total <clears throat> of the aggregate dollar amount of the failed assets from the three failures, three alone this year, rising to over $550 million, uh, billion. This is three failures that are over 151% greater than the next largest year of failures, which was in 2008 during the financial crisis, where the failures, failed assets amounted to just over 360 billion. In 2008, there were 25 failures. As things calmed down and the market sh shook itself out, there were successive failures in the couple of years after 2008 where you can see the number of banks that failed were relatively higher, but the size of those banks in a normal shaking out was much smaller, uh, 140 at only 169 billion in 2009. 157 in the following year for 92 uh, billion. And then after that, a certain number, but really the shakeout occurred and was completed by 2012, 2013, and, and matters were relatively quiet until this year. The order of magnitude is great, and the issues are great. And let's start to explore a little bit of the causes. Why did this happen? I'd like to take reference to a couple of uh, macro trends before I turn to the specifics of each of the three banks. And the one data point that I would like to refer to on the macro side is the dangerously high proportion of uninsured deposits that uh, the banks in question and other banks presently maintain. If we go back to 2019, we can see um, the uh, we can see that um, the uh, measure of uninsured deposits, both in terms of dollar amount, 
um, and ratio to total domestic deposits is relatively high. Um, it peaked and was extraordinarily high in Q3 of 2021, and it is still at a relatively higher level as we speak today. If we were to look at Silicon Valley Bank and Signature Bank alone, they had some of the highest proportions of estimated uninsured domestic deposits across the entire industry. It's shocking, the numbers are shocking. Silicon Valley Bank ranked second among banks more than $50 billion in assets, with 93.9% .9 of its total domestic deposits being uninsured, namely more than $250,000, whereas Signature Bank ranked fourth as of year in 2022. It's a big issue. Against that backdrop, let's look at some of the specifics. What happened at Silicon Valley Bank? What happened at Signature? And uh, what happened at First Republic? So I'd like to start with Silicon Valley Bank. And let's pay attention to the numbers and the trends because what we will see is that there are some very simple common threads that run through all three of the banking institutions. Number one, as you can see through the numbers, deposit inflows outstripped loan demand. The deposits were growing at an extraordinary pace. You can see between 2019 year end and 2021 year end, deposits grew 200%. While during the same period, demand for and the actual making of loans contracted. Um, during the same period, deposit growth for all FDIC insured institutions grew at roughly 26%. So you could see the hyper growth of the deposits that Silicon Valley Bank was taking on without the offsetting demand for the loans, the, the, game, the name of the game, I don't need to tell the bankers in this crowd or the corporates that it's always matching liabilities and assets and managing the risk that would come out of imbalance. And at the same time, what Silicon Valley Bank did in order to manage this mismatch was to put their deposits to work in securities that presented undue duration and interest rate risk. They took long-term bets in low, very low yielding assets. They had a concentration of 55% in long duration and low yield securities, securities that were yielding roughly 1.59%. And at the same time, as we discussed, they had a very high concentration in non-insured deposits. What that led to was an explosive factor a factor of a dangerously low liquidity level of 58 billion, which provided only 19% coverage on the long-term money, money market deposits that they were holding on behalf of their clients. The proverbial substance hit the fan, and it appears that nobody was in the driver's seat. Very interestingly, the chief risk officer of the bank resigned in April of 22. And during the eight month period from that resignation until the bank failure, when the warning signs of clear and present danger existed, there was no chief risk officer in place. During that time, uh, the bank was experiencing, and this, these were like not just uh, yellow lights flashing, not just dim lights flashing, but very bright red lights flashing and saying, gentlemen and ladies, you are earning a very low 1.59% on the majority of your investment portfolio. Interest rates, after a very long period of time of staying stable, have now jumped in a short period of time over 377 bips, that invites a response. 
and there was a shocking failure, a shocking failure of the bank to react with effective risk management techniques to manage the risk. Now, there is a very interesting point, distinctive and unique to this set of circumstances, which we are going to see repeated over and over, and which is not going to go away, which is that the bank run in this case was brought about by social media. The minute that all of the techies and the VCs felt that there was instability and risk, everybody was on Twitter, everybody was on Instagram, everybody was on whatever platform that they used to communicate, and news went viral. Word traveled far too fast for anybody, management, regulators, policymakers, to intervene. Silicon Valley Bank <clears throat> announced on March 8th that it was going to raise $2.25 billion, perhaps a little bit too late, to address the $1.8 billion loss that they had incurred and announced on their earnings call uh, some days prior. The news went viral. As soon as the news went viral, their fundraising efforts in the public and private markets did not stand a chance. And on March 8th, 2023, more than 25% of their deposit base went poof. It went into thin air. Depositors called on $42 billion of deposits in one day. Of course, the Fed and the FDIC have ample stress tests to deal with risk. But when deposits are moving out of your bank with such magnitude and velocity, no stress test in the world is going to help. So now let's take a look at, uh, at Signature, what happened with Signature Bank. Similar trend, unchecked rapid growth, and unchecked rapid growth with a tint of VC intact as well, with a dramatic shift in their business strategy. The bank was formed in 2001. It was a very formed and grew for the first 16 or 17 years of its existence as a very traditional com commercial real estate and commercial and industrial lender. They basically did real estate business and served the small to mid-market corporate, corporates. In 2018, somebody in management got a bright idea that it's time to shift from fuddy-duddy, stable CRE and CNI lending into something that is more in vogue, perhaps hip, perhaps cool. Let us jump on the VC boat, let us jump on the tech boat. And so the bank um, ventured into two very large new business areas and with size, came a ton of risk. And those two business areas were inextricably linked to the venture capital and technology industries. First of all, they went full-fledged into digital currency, digital assets business. And second of all, <clears throat> they started a new line of lending called subscription line lending where a bank will extend loans to a fund platform and take that fund's commitments from its investors as security. Life is fine when business is good, and when business is not, you will see in just a moment, it's not. At the same time, as they were experiencing a rapid growth in their business, some of the numbers of which we'll see in a second, their rapid growth came with a similar phenomenon as we had seen with Silicon Valley Bank in that the vast proportion of their deposits similarly were uninsured. So let's take a look at the numbers. Total assets in the year or two prior to the failure increased by 175%. Fast growth or slow growth? Hyper growth. Uh, in in two, year end 2017, they were at $43.1 billion in assets, and all of a sudden in 2021, 
they had grown almost threefold, exceptional growth in assets, to 118.4 billion. Their growth trajectory was far steeper than all of their peers put together. If you look at asset growth for their peer group during the same period, growth was brisk at 33% for the peer group, whereas Signature grew at 134%. Risky or not risky. And the PE fund lending in which they engaged as a subsect uh, of, uh, of the asset growth uh, started in 2018 um, and grew to four billion in loan assets by the end of 2020. And by June 2022, they were at $31 billion in subscription line loans alone. High concentration in this particular type of loan asset. So you have a rapid growth of uninsured deposits combined with uh, a very uh, staunch growth, uh, both in dollar terms and uh, in percentage terms. And we've given you just now uh, the size of their PE fund lending. On the digital asset side, you can similarly see that in 2021, they grew from the year prior 22.9 billion to 42.9 billion, a 68% increase. But in particular, I'd like to bring to your attention the growth in digital asset business, which was at $19.7 billion for 2021, which was a, representing a 219% increase. And of their deposit base, these very risky digital asset deposits were 27% of their total deposit base. On top of the fund risks with their fund lending business, and on top of the risks with their digital assets deposit taking business, they also had an exceptionally and unhealthy level of concentration in their depositor base. 60 of their clients' account balances, 60 of their client account balances were greater than 250 million. That means that one client, one client had deposits of 250 million or more multiplied by 60. Do the math and figure out the percentage of their total depositors. For those that are good with numbers in the crowd, you will come up with a division based on the numbers up above of greater than 40%. Luckily, I was able to get that number from analysis uh, on open sources. I'm not very good with numbers, which is why I went to law school. <laughs> a high concentration of large depositors combined with inherent risks of a rocket growth uh, in digital assets business and rocket growth in private equity uh, venture capital lending. And this is merely pictorially what I've just explained to you. Uh, the bottom line is their digital assets. The top line is total assets. Uh, the yellow line are deposits and the red line are uninsured deposits at an alarmingly high level. So a very simple story um, with Signature. Their liquidity, same as Silicon Valley Bank, deteriorated exceptionally rapidly. In 2021 year end, their liquid assets were 44% of total assets, cash on hand 30 billion. By the end of 22, they had a, a, a very sharp deposit contraction um, that came with crypto volatility uh, and rising interest rates. The same exact story as Silicon Valley Bank. And look at the decline, 30 billion down to 17 point, um, uh, sorry, 30 billion cash on hand down to 6.1 billion. Um, uninsured deposits measuring 90% of total deposits just south of Silicon Valley Bank, but still dangerously high. 
And by late 2022, the bank simply could not react to stress from the crypto industry shock. Uh, the uh, regulators, the FDIC, issued a report on what happened at Signature. Their conclusions are here in quotes on the slide. The bank management was slow in reacting. When they did react, they were reactive and they were not proactive. They did not take the issue seriously. They were disengaged and dismissive, quote unquote, and they were unresponsive to criticism. This is not the type of client that a compliance defense lawyer would like to have in terms of client management. But this is the dream client for a bank compliance lawyer in that you make a lot of money off of a client like this because the issues were so extraordinarily large and the client was engaged in wholly not positive behavior. And their subscription loans, the loans that they were making to the venture capital funds, um, the FDIC noted that uh, the bank management simply failed to respond to requests for prudent liquidity contingency planning, prudent liquidity stress testing, and prudent internal controls while their business doubled in size. Shocking, shocking behavior. Um, so let's now shift to um, First Republic. And, and this is the last of the, the specifics uh, slides, but I, I didn't want to give you the uh, full gory details of what happened at First Republic because it's a similar, almost exact story as the first two. There simply was irreverence to prudent risk management at the bank. The bank delivered very solid Q4 2022 financial results but then all of a sudden, with rate increases, their interest, their interest expenses soared to exceptionally high levels, 2,040% year on year, and 153% higher interest expenses from the previous quarter. Can you imagine? Your costs going up 153% in one quarter, that requires a, a swift reaction. Their shares value fell 62% in mid-March, uh, um, and they did receive, um, with a, a light or more than light government hand involved, they did receive an infusion um, through 30 billion of deposits from a commercial bank, private commercial bank consortium led by JP Morgan Chase. But then, even that was not enough, and their Q1 2023 earnings report was nothing less than a train wreck, nothing less than a disaster. They had a 41% deposit outflow, 41% of deposits left the bank. Their net interest margin sharply declined, 68 basis points. They had a a uh, quarter measure of non-interest expenses of 852 million, and so what is one to do? The market reacted exactly the way that it is expected to react when one sees such alarm bells, when one sees such a very bright, bright flashing neon lights, and their stock value dropped 95% um, from its value in the previous month. So let's take a look, let's zoom out a bit from these three cases and let's look at, in the round, what are the common threads that run through each of these three cases? And it's not, it's not rocket science at all. It is very much not newfangled uh, contagion risk that one needs to have a, a, a Nobel Prize theory to manage. Simply and basically, there was extraordinarily poor liquidity management. You could see the train wreck coming miles away. The billionaire hedge fund manager, Paul Tudor Jones, 
made a very, very apt observation. Liquidity is one of those things that doesn't matter until it does. And in this case, overnight, in a week, in three weeks, in five weeks, it mattered. And it mattered in such a way that all three of these banks failed. And they failed on, relatively speaking, much larger, exponentially larger measures than the United States has ever seen. Secondly, as we pointed out very vividly, the numbers show that each of the banks had an, an unacceptably unhealthy high level of uninsured deposits in excess of 90% of total deposits. Thirdly, there, the management was, was not just out to lunch. Apparently, they didn't care. There was an extreme failure of effective risk management response. But the really interesting one, which is different, you know, on Passover, we ask four questions in our Passover liturgy, which is the holiday that we just celebrated, marking our exodus from Egypt, and we ask, what is different about this night than all other nights? So what is different about this bank failure from all other bank failures? And the, the key difference, in addition to the first three basic ones, are the fact that this is the first time that we are seeing systemic risk, systemic risk, not just ordinary risk, not just one institution, but systemic risk that was brought about by crypto contagion. And one can mark the events. And in fact, let's have a look, let's have a quick look at the events. We are showing on this slide a correlation between signature stock price and the crypto market. And I'm sure that we could plot out and we would see roughly the same downward trend uh, from, from the other two banks. But in the case of Signature, uh, their stock price was humming away at north of 300, let's call it th uh, 325, in January of 22. All of a sudden, Terra and Luna collapse, uh, and by May, they're down below 200. There's a further event with Celia, uh, Celsius Network, and yet a further event with Voyager, um, with failures and bankruptcies, and the stock drops even further, closer to 150, and then all of a sudden comes along the brilliant, the brilliant uh, finance wizard um, uh, with FTX, uh, and his company goes out the window. Uh, in, in November of 22, the stock uh, drops even further. Um, there's yet another event, but then when Silvergate hits, on March 8th, uh, which is a West Coast crypto firm, crypto bank, uh, that was basically the end of the story. Within 13 months, the stock went from 325 down to south of uh, 100, and now it's even less than that. So there is a very, very distinct correlation between crypto market and the bank failures. It's not the only explanation, but it is a key and distinctive explanation. So let's take a look at what happened. Let's take a look at what the regulator's response was. It was largely the same <clears throat> with, uh, with one, one minor distinction with First Republic, but there were two exceptional actions that were taken by the FDIC and the Fed. First of all, the FDIC invoked its systemic risk exception. And the systemic risk exception, the systemic risk exception is a statutory exception. There are legal standards for it. And it is the legal basis for the FDIC to say that I am going to backstop. I'm going to ensure your deposits, even those that are greater than $250,000, which is the FDIC insurance ceiling. It is an extraordinary exception. And, and in addition to invoking the systemic risk exception, the FDIC took receivership, obviously, of all three institutions. So for the first time in a long time, we are seeing the Fed 
break through its sacrosanct rule that is set in law that was debated for years in Congress of what the ceiling of insured deposits should be. Which means that the FDIC fund, which is funded by taxpayers, would have to step in to cover. And we'll quantify those numbers in just a second. But at the same time, it's not just taxpayer money that is going to address the insurability and the insurance of uninsured deposits. In addition to that, the Fed uh, stepped up and provided short-term liquidity injections through a new facility that was formed in the weekend after receivership of Silicon Valley Bank, which is uh, under, the, under the term uh, or, or program of the BTFP the bank term funding loan. Completely new program set into place during the weekend after SVB failed. And what that fund does is provides short-term one-year liquidity to qualifying banks such as Silicon Valley Bank, such as Signature, such as First Republic. And that funding is supported and backed by government debt securities. Yet another form of taxpayer taxpayer funded support. So what does that tell you about how we should characterize these two government actions? Is it a bailout or is it not a bailout? So I found two rather entertaining cartoons, uh, political cartoons that appear in, uh, it, that appeared in, in, in well-known newspapers in the United States, the first one being the imagery of the Titanic with the FDIC labeled on it. Titanic clearly hit an iceberg, it's going down, and the captain is, is, is uh, broadcasting in the highest of his tone and the highest of his voice, uh, no need to panic, we have a lifeboat. And the second one is, um, these are not mahjong tiles, these are actually dominoes. Um, and in America, I'm sure as here, we have a game of dominoes where you line up the dominoes and then you tilt the first one, and when it hits the second one, you have a domino effect, and, and the whole structure uh, topples down. And so the depiction here is Silicon Valley at the very left, which is the beginning of the domino fall, followed by Silvergate, followed by Signature, followed by regional banks, followed by medium banks, followed by large banks, and then followed ultimately by the whole of the banking system with the comment from Uncle Sam being, don't call it a bailout if, don't call it a bailout if you want, but everyone knows I'm the real backstop. And of course, little does he know that that big domino is coming to crush him, which is obviously imagery to fiscal pressure, to inflation, uh, to the impact on taxpayers. So the question is, was this the right result or not? And you can imagine, beginning with Silicon Bank, there was a stampede. Uh, there was a financial stampede, but in addition to that, there was a political stampede. And the whole situation renewed the debate as we last had very vigorously in the wake of the financial crisis of 2008 that resulted in the Dodd-Frank Act. The Dodd-Frank Act was an act of thousands of pages which required thousands of regulatory actions in order to shore up the financial system with regulation after regulation after regulation after regulation. Here we are in 2023. I don't have the current numbers available, but I think that not more than half, not more than half, 15 years later, of the required regulatory actions under Dodd-Frank have been taken. And look where we are today. And it's, so it's the old debate. The left is arguing if we had more regulation, then we would have been fine. Well, take reference to Dodd-Frank. And the right is saying that the system and the markets should take care of themselves. So who is right? Is it appropriate for government to take a heavy hand, to take a light hand, or to take no hand at all? In these three cases, the government took, at least in the first two, a heavy hand. Um, the follow-on question from that, because 
what has been done to break through the deposit ceiling is effectively to say that the FDIC, through its fund, that is funded by taxpayers, is essentially going to insure all deposits, regardless of size, notwithstanding the $250,000 ceiling. And thirdly, should we impose impossibly, bur impossibly burdensome regulation, as we saw in the wake of Dodd-Frank, which clearly did not address the circumstances that we have at hand. So it all comes down to the bottom line. Who is to pay? Should the depositors pay? Or should the taxpayers pay? Let's take a look at a couple of, um, of numbers here. Between 1991 and 2023, the FDIC invoked the systemic risk exception five times. Only five times. Within a short number of weeks, you've had invoking of the systemic risk exception three times. All of those five times prior to 2023 were during the 2008 financial crisis between September of 08 and March of 09. It was very, very limited in period, limited in scope, and limited in quantum of cover. Within a few short weeks, the taxpayers are now picking up a $22.5 billion loss to the FDIC fund in the form of a special assessment fee that was imposed on banks in Silicon Valley, and which represents roughly 15% of the fund. And in the case of First Republic, the cost has been so far 13 billion. How much of the fund is available? How much is left? And how much can the fund bear? And this is just three, three failures with, I suspect, more to come. We are left with trying to pick up the pieces. And ladies and gentlemen, it's not a pretty picture at all. I take reference, not to my words, you don't need to listen to me, but to the head of supervision at the Fed, Michael Barr, who is the vice chair for supervision at the Board of Governors of the Federal Reserve System. There was a report that the Fed issued just a few weeks ago, at the end of April, I think it was April 28th, 2023, uh, providing their views and their analysis of the Federal Reserve supervision and regulation of Silicon Valley Bank. And what did Michael Barr have to say about the situation in Silicon Valley, both of management of the bank and of the Fed's regulators? Silicon Valley Bank's board of directors and management failed to manage their risks. Supervisors did not fully appreciate the extent of the vulnerabilities as Silicon, Bank, Silicon Valley Bank grew in size and complexity. When supervisors did identify vulnerabilities, they did not take sufficient steps to ensure that Silicon Valley Bank fixed those problems quickly enough. And finally, the board's tailoring approach and the shift in the stance of supervisory policy impeded effective supervision, impeded effective supervision by reducing standards, increasing complexity, and promoting a less assertive supervisory approach. Not pretty reading. Not what one likes to read out of the main federal banking regulator. And ladies and gentlemen, I would say, and I would observe, that this is the beginning. And without question, there is more stress to come. We are in the middle of an exceptionally challenging interest rate environment. It is without question the new normal. Jeffrey and I were discussing this over dinner last night and, and a few times prior to that. The situation is not going to change overnight. And with a, an unstable and high interest rate environment, unquestionably, 
the economy will be impacted, it will be constricted, and it will not grow. And the unrealized losses abound. We've read about and we looked at a bar chart that demonstrably showed the high level of failures through just three banks in a short span of a couple of months. Let's consider what else is out there lurking beneath the water, or maybe not even beneath the water. Maybe, maybe there are actually icebergs that are way, way above the water that people just are not paying attention to. But let's look at the alarming numbers. There are roughly, as we sit here today in the US banking system, there are roughly $2.2 trillion in unrealized losses accumulated in the US banking market. Not dissimilar at all, and in fact exactly like what Signature, SVP, and First Republic had on their balance sheets. If you look at the mark to market average, the US banks as a whole, it should be apostrophe after the S, not US bank apostrophe S, but US banks apostrophe, unrealized losses is roughly 9% of all of their combined balance sheets. And ten, there are 10% of banks that are holding unrealized losses even greater than SVB's unrealized losses at the time of their failure. These are pretty scary numbers. So what do we do? Many have observed that perhaps now is the time, the unique time for consolidation. <coughs> it's very interesting that in the wake of the 2008 financial crisis, from 2008 through 2022, the number of banks, commercial banks in the United States dropped 43% from 7,290 to 4,135. And that was a phenomenon. Uh, that was a natural reaction of failure, survival of the fittest, and smart combinations to capitalize on strengths and weaknesses of separate entities combined. Um, of course, the regulatory posture has been both on the Hill from the policy legislative standpoint at the agencies from the policy standpoint has been concern about financial institutions that are too big to fail and as a result there has been a chilling effect on regulatory actions to approve mergers to approve acquisitions and in fact the Fed Reserve Chair, Jay Powell, just on May 3rd, last week, observed in the Federal Open Market Committee that it is good policy that we don't want the largest banks doing big acquisitions. Even that being said, there's plenty of opportunity for small and medium-sized institutions to combine and to create much more solid bases off of which to offer. And so the simple observation is that strategic combinations that are focused on comparative strengths and weaknesses of regionals and even local banks would definitely strengthen the base of the US banking market. So let's have a look at the future. Um, we are at an extremely important crossroads. And we need to have a look at what we have seen in the recent past. There are some very clear messages and some very clear trends that have come out of the three recent bank failures. But there is a ton of historic reference um, that we can look at as well. And we need to take, first of all, a very hard look at the root cause of the recent failures. So, at its most basic level, it doesn't take a nuclear physicist. It doesn't take a banker of the stature of some of you in the room today to know that it's 
very challenging um, to legislate for the conduct of gross mismanagement. Um, it's difficult, if not impossible, to legislate for greed and stupidity. And I would say that one simple lesson that we have to learn that runs through all three of these cases is a very fundamental and basic moral lesson. The management of the three institutions that we talked about today was simply out to lunch, oblivious to the extraordinary risks that were opposed to their institutions and more importantly to their shareholders and to the taxpayers ultimately. Um, there is a moral lesson to be learned. But in addition to that, the terrain, the backdrop, certainly has changed um, with the growth of digital assets and with the growth of VC that is uh, accompanying um, the whole technology and innovation sector. Um, and what we can see that runs through all three of the cases that we talked about today is that there was a, an overly high concentration of risk within one single institution on venture capital and the technology sector. That is a very strong, brilliant, common thread that runs through all three, which is a, a, new, a new risk factor. Secondly, the circumstances do really require uh, a fresh look at fiscal policy, prevailing fiscal policy of the type of dipping into the FDIC fund that we've seen over the past two weeks. And it requires a fresh look at FDIC market guidance and of banking regulation generally. And let's take, let's take those three each in turn. We saw excessive stimulus going back 30 to 40 years during and leading up to the SNL crisis. And that was stimulus that was provided by the Johnson and Nixon administrations and that ultimately triggered the SNL crisis. What we have seen recently is not small stimulus and one can only wonder whether a check on fiscal policy, a rethink on fiscal policy, of course nobody ever wants to admit that they were wrong, um, but it is the reality. Secondly, I have spoken at length when I had the great honor to serve my country as Assistant Secretary for International Markets on topics relating to innovation and particularly financial innovation and its impact on uh, stable growth uh, and financial stability. And um, it's a challenge. Um, the Innovation moves along. Um, it provides great efficiency, and I have some statistics and data that I, I want to refer to, I hope, during Q&A that are, are mind-boggling and, and very interesting at the same time. But the reality is that innovation in the financial sector, in every single layer and every single discipline uh, and subdivision of the financial sector is bringing enormous regulatory challenge. And the question is how to react. Do we regulate crypto or do we not regulate crypto? Uh, do we regulate this or do we re And if we do regulate, what level of strength, light hand or heavy hand, do we take? What is most appropriate in order to ensure safety and prudence on the one hand? but also to ensure that we are fostering innovation and growth. It's a big question. It's a question that we were grappling with under the Trump administration. There was a great study that was issued by the Treasury Department that all of you can find on the internet in 2017 or 2018. It still holds true today. It's a couple hundred pages, but it's definitely worth the read. I personally would have thrown in a couple of other comics, you know, a few cartoons in the study, but uh, alas, I was not in charge of that, that particular study. Um, in terms of, of regulation and, and rethink, um, 
it, it is a time uh, to rethink the issue of size bank regulate size based regulation. There are some newer elements of federal banking regulation um, that do add. Uh, additional discipline that have added over the past number of years, additional discipline to banks based on size, but the events uh, over the past couple of months do clearly indicate that it is appropriate to revisit this. On the issue of FDIC market guidance, it's interesting to compare what happened in the first two cases of SVP, SVB and Signature and, um, and, and the last case that we've seen. Um, <clears throat> in the first two instances, uh, th there was, a, there was a, a clear calamity and disaster, um, and many will argue that the FDIC did not step in quickly, decisively, and strongly enough to ensure that there was somebody there to pick up the pieces. In the most recent case, J.P. Morgan has stepped in, and it stepped in prior to complete market disruption relating to that particular institution. But in the case of Silicon Valley Bank at Signature, FDIC didn't. And you can compare the market disruption, market impact of one approach versus the other, which would argue for FDIC moving quicker and stepping in with a slightly stronger hand than it did uh, in the first two cases. Next, the impact of social media and herd behavior. We're, ladies and gentlemen, we're in a new era. Um, I, I can see that, that most people in the room uh, are roughly as young as I am, <laughs> right? Um, there are not people in this room that are markedly younger than we are and who live their lives in a very, very different way than we do. I would like to think of, my, of myself as, as hip and cool. Uh, I have a device, you know, and I'm kind of on the device. I'm pretty good with it. I don't always need my, my very techie geek son to help me out with everything on the computer, but it's a different world. Social interaction of young people is different the wealth accumulation on a relative basis of young people is different. Like it or not, ladies and gents, these young folks that are younger than us, they control, they influence. And we can see that through clicks, small but numerous clicks that happened in the wake and, and, be, and the beginning of the run on Silicon Valley Bank. And so therefore, um, we need to take into account and press our policymakers and press our legislators to understand, appreciate, and take into account the instantaneous behavior that has given rise to the almost immediate poof failure of very, very large financial, inst financial institutions. And out of that inspection and introspection, to create appropriate guardrails that, that clearly were not in place. My final point is ultimately what should the people in positions of influence be doing? What I have observed through debate, policy debate, through executive action, uh, through discussions at think tanks, is that there's a lot of finger pointing. Those on the left are pointing fingers at those on the right that it must be all their fault, and those on the right are pointing their fingers at the people on the left. And now, at the brink of, of, of being on the edge of something that is no less than potentially disastrous, wholly volatile and disruptive to the markets, it's a time for our leaders to stand up and to be strong, to take firm action, to provide firm guidance, and act with calm heads. Thank you very much.